Last week, um, Pastor Linda shared a message about keeping the fire. Who was here? That was good, wasn't it? So, no pressure on me. <laughs> I need to follow up for that. Um, Pastor Johnny uh, is going to be speaking next week, and he is celebrating him and Johnny, or Donna. We call him Johnny. What do we do? Go Donnie and Jonna. How many do that? God, I don't know how many times I've done that. Anyway, Pastor Johnny and Donna are celebrating Ariana's birthday. So that's where they're at today in their apologies and various things. I want to maximize our moment this, this day on a word, and you'll see it come up here. And we get a, we, we have an English word called worship. But it is a two-part word, actually, worth ship. And basically, very simply, is that worth, meaning value, um, highly valued, various things, you know, there, there, there's things that we determine that are worth, or a person is worthy. And we sing that song, you know, he's worthy of it all. Um, so worth. And ship means that we're, we're going somewhere with this. It's not just aimless. It's not haphazard. It's like it's, it's got a goal in mind to establish worth and to center that worth on a person particularly. So I want to go to a go-to place for me um, where a lot of questions are answered. Uh, I'm thinking at this stage of life, after 56 years of following Jesus, I'm thinking like, uh, how do I grow in my understanding? How do we grow in our understanding of this thing called worship? The, the what of it, the, the why of it, uh, the who, the how. Where do we go in the Bible to gain the greatest understanding about it? Um, the purposes. So I want to go to John chapter 4, which is the woman at the well, where I've been looking at it for 42 years. And staring at this particular passage, and I want to just lovingly, hopefully, walk us through, talk us through in just the next few minutes, a few things out from this passage. And what I want to do is particularly the core. It's a wonderful conversation. And what's unique about John and his writings is that he brings us and transports us into the human side of things, into the dialogue. We get John 2, we get the wedding at Cana, John 3, we get the conversation with Nicodemus, John 4, the woman at the well. Uh, there are so many other aspects of the writings of John. So we've got this conversation with this woman at the well. And I'm going to read it, verses 21 through 26. So it's going to come up here. It says there, Jesus replied, Believe me, dear woman, the time is coming when it will no longer matter whether you worship the Father on this mountain or in Jerusalem. You Samaritans know very little about the one you worship, while we Jews know all about him, for salvation comes through the Jews. But the time is coming, indeed it is here now, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The Father is looking for those who will worship him that way. For God is spirit, so those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know the Messiah is coming, the one who is called Christ. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus told her, I am the Messiah. Wow, can you imagine that? Where you have this personal one-on-one -on -one physically, where you can see him just the way he is talking to you. Wow, what an encounter. What an incredible conversation. Like I said, personal journey with this 42 years. It's my go-to place because I think it's defined here better than any other place in the entirety of the Bible. Is this conversation. And Jesus being the great announcement, the messenger, the person who's come to set the record straight, to authentically speak about this most wonderful being called Abba, Father God, to introduce us. So if I want to be an authentic, 
truly authentic worshiper of God. There are things here that I need to wrestle with. I need the help of the Holy Spirit to understand. And I dare I say, I hope that, that, it, that at the end of this message, you'll feel the same way. So to grow our understanding, the why, the what, the where, the who, the how, that's why we come here. Because they're answered in this passage. Just what we read there in those first five, ver- those five verses, those things are answered for us. You see, because the way Father looked at this woman was entirely different from her culture. She was a part of a rejected race, the Samaritan. They were hated by the Jews. And the, conversely, the Samaritans didn't like and the, the Jews as well. So you have that within the first few lines of a dialogue that he has with this woman, is that you being a Jew, how come you're talking to me? Let alone you being a man and things of that nature. And it's just also there are six layers that Jesus walks through to get to this woman's heart in this conversation. It's powerful. Because you see, Father saw something. First of all, he sees a, a worshiper, but I think that the way he saw her is he saw her as a prisoner of war. She had been captured, ensnared by a whole lot of things from religious order to ritual things to uh, things of the past to things that she had done. In her misdirecting worship to other things, monuments, men, he's sees her as a prisoner of war, and he sends his son, the savior of the world, to rescue her. So wonderful. He came after her. So let's look at these things. The core, the core of this message, the core of this element as we read it, is they that worship the Father must How much wiggle room is there in must? (laughs) You and I sit here today, and all of us are wired incredibly different, but then the uniqueness of the same element is that we like our preferences. Okay? You prefer to have things a certain way. You like certain foods. You like certain things. You like certain things a certain way. You know, you have preferences in regards to even worship style, music. Some like it. Yesteryear, some like the up-to-date, some like it loud, some like it soft, like you have preferences. But you'll notice in the go-to element of how Jesus is communicating this, he doesn't talk about that. In fact, he says, believe you me, an hour is coming, and he says, and now is. When it's not Jerusalem or this place called Samaria, or this mountain, or that mountain, or that style, or this style, or that music, or that music, they that worship the Father must wrestle with two things called spirit and truth to authentically worship Him. The one who determines whether it's actually acceptable worship or not. It's not you. It's Him. And Jesus is trying to set this woman free from a prison of religious stuff and her own preferences and her own decision-making that has taken this thing called worship and focused it. I think what's motivating me, and I guess in our meetings and planning, when I spoke up, they, they said, you need to speak on that, was, is I'm wrestling with this myself. Worship. And like I said, I go to this place. This is where I go. So well before I got up here to speak about it, I went to this place again to look at this. How am I going to, if, so follow my logic. If, if we were created by Father, our highest call in the created elements, what motivated him was relationship. He created us to have connection and relationship with him and to him. And the main pathway and the main way in which that happens is through this agency called worship. So for me, it makes sense that if I'm going to grow to the fullest potential in my relationship with him and to the 
elements that God wants to bring about, and it would be the same for you, is that we must become committed to studying worship to be an incredible student of it. Every man, woman, and child on the planet worships. No exceptions, because it's in our DNA from our creator. It's stamped on us. We all worship something or someone or whatever. We all direct our worship to something. And it's indicated, measured by time. How much time do we put onto this? In fact, you can look it up. I can probably look it on and see four or five hours worth of stuff because I have a game that I play. <laughs> <laughs> it's called Wordscapes. It's good game. You know, exercise the brain. <laughs> good game. But there's lots of things that we are under our jurisdiction that are under this broad band of worth-ship. Right, worth-ship. So the first thing that we need to acknowledge is that there is, number one, a war of worship. And if we're ignorant to it, then we will never pursue our, uh, growing our understanding of worship because there's a war for it. And it didn't start on this planet. It started way before the first human ever arrived on the planet. And it goes right back. And there's a couple of places where like the curtain is pulled back and we get a prophetic view of a happening that took place right at the very throne of God. We're a being who is created by God for the very specific purpose of worship, arguably was the worship leader of heaven who conducted and brought like a skillful com conductor of an orchestra and choir combined would bring the angelic order to the, and direct their worship toward God. And his name was Lucifer. And he had instruments woven into his basket. He had all sorts of things. It's described that his being was all made up of, of, of beautiful stone and patternry. It was an amazing creature. And the saddest word in the Isaiah 14 and the Ezekiel 28 windows is the word until. Until it was discovered. Until this one who said, I will exalt my throne above. I will, you know, take the worship that's meant for him to me. It started there. And so the result was one-third. He was skillful, amazingly skillful, to talk the, 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 the order of the angelic order into an re open rebellion against God. It's a war on, folks. And if war has transferred from the portal in heaven to earth, and you know what? The war is intensifying. Over time, particularly these last few years, have you noticed? It's just, it's ramping up because there's, there's a lot at stake. It's war. It's in that context. There's a prisoner of war that Jesus has been sent by Father to go and talk to. And in talking with her, help her get free. So she can direct that worship to the one that's worthy. So this war of worship that then explains, number two, the why of worship. Why worship? What's so potent about this? Well, Psalm 115, verse 8, and Psalm 135, 18, coming as a reference, it just simply says that, that the worship of idols, it says this, that they that worship them, idols, okay, they that worship them become just like them. So the potency of worship and why it's so powerful and what's at stake is we, we become like what we worship. If we're worshiping dead things, what do you think we're going to bear the image in our soul? We're going to be dead in our inner person. Whatever we devote our time to, whatever we devote our attention to, our thought processes, or our emotions, uh, various other things, these lesser things, the most, when we devote those things to it, those are the measurements. The potency of it is we become like what we worship. 
So the worship of idols, that's why right from the outset, thou shalt not have no other gods before me, right? The very first command. Why? It's because God's got, he's, he's, he's insecure. No, he's not. He's smart. He knows that the worshiper of lesser things is you become just like that. So if he's in that place, if he's in his rightful place, and we cooperate and focus in our attentions as best we can upon him with the help of the Holy Spirit, the overtime principle is that we begin to bear the image of him. How many want to be like him? then the prescribed pathway biblically is worship. It's potency. The why of worship, the what of worship. It's found in this passage, John verse, chapter 4, verse 23. He says that, that worship the Father must worship in spirit and truth. C.S. Lewis coined the phrase, the genius of the end. That it's not just spirit and it's not just truth it's the combination and the wrestling match between both spirit and truth if you look at an analysis in the makeup and tonight our brother Dolly is going to talk about over the next few weeks about why denominations are one. it's interesting that the makeup of church life kind of you you could you could say that there's a whole genre of church and churches out there that worship and their expression of worship is would be worship in spirit all right then there's a whole group out there that where they're focused on truth exacting truth it's almost like father son holy scriptures not father son holy spirit it's almost like, like father son holy scriptures and there's truth But notice how Jesus sent from heaven. He's the messenger. He's the Messiah. He's the explainer of who Father is because he knows his Father. He's one with the Father. You've seen me. You've seen Father. He's saying to this woman at the well, it's the combination of these two things, spirit and truth. That's the water of worship, the componentry, if you would say, the substances You can even look at it perhaps like this, the spirit and truth as being, spirit being like the heart and truth being like the mind. When you get the spirit and the mind on the same page with the will in submission to that, oh my goodness. The war within gets settled. Outside it might be absolute chaos, but inside you're an inward place of peace and rest because you've got your heart and your mind and your will all focused on the same one, the Prince of Peace. So worship is very potent. It's very powerful. But the water worship is a, and you also could say that this is that could spirit and truth also be the Holy Spirit, truth being the person of Jesus And that the relationship with those two within this Godhead helps us to authentically worship Father. I need their help. How about you? I need their help. I need spirit and truth. I need to wrestle with this and go through the various things to get my mind with the help of the spirit to get clarity about things. Not everything is clear. Many things are hidden. It it is not easy. This book is a closed book, friend. It's a book of revelation, and it's closed. You can read it from cover to cover and know it and not know God at all. So you need the spirit and truth and the combination and the working together to authentically worship Father God. Which comes and brings us to the who of worship. Jesus is saying there is a person behind all of this. There's a person in which the focus of your worship and your time, your energy, your talents, your gifts, all the things that are under your jurisdiction, under your arsenal to be directed toward is a person and his name is Father. The Old Testament, they they knew him as Jehovah or Yahweh and various other various names and he in fact there are 27 different Jehovah 
Jehovah Nisi, Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Sidkenu, all these different various. There, there was enormous numbers of names, but Jesus comes along and cuts through all of that, doesn't diss any of that, but says there's an ultimate revelation that's above everybody else, and his name is Father. He's the God and Father of us all. I don't know about you, but personally, what that's done for me, well, that revelation and this focus coming to this passage has helped me with is to understand that whatever my place, my earthly father, whether good, bad, or different, I'm not fatherless here today. And neither are you. And it's a lie to say they're fatherless because there's a God and father of us all. And the prescribed pathway to knowing him and understanding him is the pathway of worship. And the substances that he has ordained and set forth that are prescribed, that he determines whether it's authentic or not, is spirit and truth. And so Jesus is sharing with this dear woman and she, he states the who of worship. Your focus is not a mountain here. It's not a, a city here. It's not over here. It's not a prescribed pathway. It's not historically found in Jacob and this and that. It is found and the hour is and now is. They that worship Father must worship in spirit and truth. It's like, dear woman, you have a father, a heavenly dad. And you can come to know him intimately by directing your worship away from men and monuments and memorials to me. Which leads us to the last part of this message, the how of worship. And worship team, would you come and get ready here? We're going to express our worship and do something very biblical here this morning. But the how of worship. Sometimes the best way to understand how is to understand what worship isn't. Worship is not music. Never has been. It's not rituals. It's not liturgy. It's not even this. Okay? Understanding what worship is not helps us to identify effectively, okay? engage in what is the highest calling. We're all called things. We're called Fathers here, mothers, wives, husbands. We're all called you know, employee, employer. We, we have all sorts of terminology, and these are good callings, and they're good things, and various things of that nature. But there is one that stands up over and above that comes to the top in the sense of the apex, the top of the order that we were created for is a loving, intimate relationship with Father and the prescribed pathway is worship. So the how? Well, friends, it's a journey of a lifetime. <laughs> you know how I can learn it overnight? It's going to be painstaking. You'll make mistakes in it and you'll have to learn repentance because that's part of the tool belt to help us refocus where our worship is to go. Is this helping anybody here today? It's not you, it's helping me. It's a journey of a lifetime. Because you see, we're on this side. So think about a couple things in the comments just to help us measure things again. You realize that when Jesus comes back, um, evangelism stops. When the Lord comes back and establishes his order fully on earth, the kingdom of God and things. There's certain things that are going to stop and cease. They've got a use-by date to them. But there's one thing that does not have a use-by date on it that will never go away, that we will go on into eternity, on and on and on, is the worship of Father. Him. It's a forever deal. And when we can't see him, 
And while we're in a sense almost like on enemy territory, when everything's against us, every kind of distraction in the book is out there to try to grab your time, try to make you a prisoner of this war, trying to do everything it can to keep you from the potency that's all when you come into intimate exchange with the one who created you. It's very potent, very powerful. It's our calling, and it's our highest calling because it's a forever calling. I'm not an evangelist forever. I'm not a prophet man because, you see, when he shows up, prophecy's done away with. Some of the gifts of the Spirit will go away because they have a use-by date on them. The how of worship, it's not music, it's a tool. And it's a Bible tool. You just read the Psalms and how many times when it's taking an instrument called a lyre in those days, and it's a guitar today. It was a 10-string instrument, and I've got a 12-string guitar, and this is a 6-string over here, but what? Okay. There are seven Hebrew words for the one word we translate praise. There are seven expressions of worship in the Hebrew understanding of our one word called praise. It's rich and it's biblical and instrument playing and singing loudly. Sing, did you hear that? Singing loudly, clapping your hands, kneeling, dancing, taking loud sounding cymbals and going is all biblical to express or find a way as a pathway to express worship to God. So here's this little summary thing that Jesus says to this woman, the Father is looking for those who will worship him in this prescribed way. Other translation says he's seeking. So if you're here today and if this resonates in you, it's because Father has searched for you. He's been looking for you. He wants you. And he wants you to come back and use this message if it's worth anything to you. And refocus. Come back to Father and say, Father, forgive me. I've made other things. I've been distracted. I'm sorry for that. Help me, Holy Spirit, to redirect my worship (sighs) to the one who's worthy of worship. So, in this house... We may not programmatically measure up to some people's expectations of a church. I don't know. We, there's lots of things that we could be and do and, 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 and whatnot. But I, our prayer over the years and our prayer now, and this what helped motivate this talk today, was simply this. We want to be a house of worship. And you notice this woman. She's deeply impacted by what Jesus said to her. I've got this deep desire I'm longing for, I'm searching for. I know when he shows up, he's going to explain a whole lot of things, a lot of questions I've got on my headspace, and his name is Messiah, and Jesus, when he disclosed that to her, she probably knew in heart that he was, but then all of a sudden it exploded in her. And you know what it exploded as? She went out from there and said, come, listen. Listen. Come, you villagers. Come, you men. Come, all you guys. Listen to some. I want you to invite you to hear someone who told me everything I've ever done. You know my track record. He knew it. He's disclosed it. Could this be the expected one? Come, come hear him. He stayed for two days, and the impact of Jesus was, he said, well, we believed your testimony, and we came, but we've now come to experience him for ourselves. And he is the one that you were talking about. Worship in authentic way will spill over in reaching out 
to others. Father, thank you. As we worship you here and use this tool of song and worship, song and music, that help us with this to focus in on you, Father God, here today. We ask it in Jesus' name.
I love what David said because it's not just about the, the music. When we talk about a sound or, or a fragrance, it's not just about the music, but it's when we're out there, when we're worshipping in our job and whatever we might be doing, there's a sound and a fragrance that lifts up. And that's when we'll see our city or our nation transform is when that sound and that fragrance in every part of sphere of society happens, not just here on a Sunday morning, but when you go to work and you lift up worship in your work. Maybe you're welding and worshiping. Maybe you're in the checkout and you're worshiping, but that sound and that fragrance begins to rise in our city. Not just in buildings across the city on a Sunday, but 24 seven. Help us Lord, help us to release that sound, release that fragrance of worship in our lives. Pastor Johnny and brought to us as a staff going up here. And 
It was the word consecration. So Aurora came up to me. I call her Aurora, but it's Cora. I can do that. Okay. What a beautiful person that Cora is. And she brought to me on the front row, and I said, I, uh, this is where we're going. So I want to ask her to share what she felt God was saying. And if you, if this resonates with you and you want to make a fresh dedication of your life to God, this front area is open to you. Feel free to come. No tug, just come. Be at home and be at rest. Here you go. Yeah, it's just feeling in my heart this sense that maybe some of us are finding it hard to fully surrender. There's still many things we want to serve or give attention to. And I was just seeing some of us being pulled in many directions. And the trust wasn't fully there that God truly is full of love. The trust isn't fully there that if I give him my time and attention and devotion, he'll have my back. He'll be there for me. And I was just sensing this pull, this pull back from trust, this pull back from surrender. And my own heart felt it. My own heart felt, can I really trust? Can I really surrender this very thing? Now, if I hold on to it, if I really work hard at it, then it will go well. But if I give it to God, if truly I surrendered this before Him, would I experience the love my heart is longing for? And so the question is here, I sense, will you surrender? Will you fully trust? What is it that you are putting above Him? What is it that you are giving attention? What is it that you are spending time in anxiety over where He has no room to come and bring the peace? Do you want to come? Do you want to surrender that? Whatever it is, it is not worth hanging on to. He's longing to look at you eye into his eye and say, come and give this to me. I surely can carry it. I surely can speak into it. And I have solutions for it. So, the Lord seems to indicate that he's asking us to make a fresh dedication. Old school world, the old school word is consecration, which means to dedicate, to do exactly what she said, to be willing to allow the Spirit of God to look over our framework of our life a week. And we're actually asking you, we asked the first service, they had a hearty amen that they would be willing to do that is that this week would be a consecrated week of dedicating, asking the simple question, Father, with where I'm at now, I know where I was there, and I know we're maybe back in this season, but in this time frame now, am I in touch with you? Am I in line with you? Am I connected with you the way I need to be? Is there anything that you would put your hand and say, give me that? Is there anything that he'd say, letting letting him, give me that? And that can be a fearful thing because there's things that are precious to us. But I have a suspect that it'll probably be in relationship to time. It's the biggest issue, time. I think if you were to say what arguably is God's love language, He loves us spending time with Him. So I'm going to ask Cora to pray for us. Pray with us, pray for us. Again, the altar space is open. You can come and use this time frame if you want to make that. There's communion available. Very little I went up to. There was hardly one used. 
What is it, folks? Do this in remembrance of me. Do it. Get over yourself and do it in Jesus' name. Lovingly, I say that as a father. Just come on. Utilize the tools that he's given us, the songs, the communion, the altar spaces, the buildings, the various things to worship him. Worship in spirit and truth. Here you go, Cora. Thank you. Heavenly Father, you are our treasure. How we love you. Your very presence transforms our heart. Looking anywhere but you disappoints. It really does. But when we come back to your very essence, you nurture, you heal, you speak, you reassure, you comfort, you guide, you convict with gentleness because it's your love that leads us to change direction. It's your kindness that leads us to this place so today we just say show us show us the places in our heart where we have not made you first where you're not our first love show me show me where I've chosen anxiety and fear where I've chosen reasoning and logic where I've chosen to elevate something or someone or a comfort above you show me the places in my heart that needs healing, that needs realigning to your truth. We want to be a community surrendered to you. We don't want to put our mind above your greatness. We want to lower our heart before you and say, you are good. You are greater than our thinking. You're greater than our ideas of the future. You're greater than our thoughts about you even. Your very presence is what we long for. May this community be one of humble hearts, surrendered before you. This is what we're crying out to. If you know right now in your heart that there's something you need to make right with Him, come, do what you know you have to do. Kneel, lay down before Him and say, I need you, I need you, I need your touch. I need your words in my life. I need your direction. You are greater than me. Heavenly Father, do what only you can do. And Holy Spirit, show us the Father.
What could I say? Come on, let's worship him. What could I do? You might be tired. Present your tiredness to him. Make the tiredness offer an offering. Give him an offering. Offer him your brokenness. Completely offer that broken relationship. Yeah. He wants those. He wants access to those. What could I say? What could I do? <laughs> to offer. But to offer this heart of mine. Completely. Father, we thank you for pursuing us and to continue to pursue this rugged heart of that sometimes, Father, we wish we could go in there and tinker with it, but the truth is only you can truly cleanse our hearts. But the agency of the blood of Jesus that cleanses from all sin, which is lodged primarily in the heart. <laughs> Get scrubbed clean again. Get washed. Get a clean conscience before God again. To get a reset. To get an opportunity to go again into our world and make a difference. Not based on self-effort, self-righteousness, all the stuff, but based upon we love by our Father. We bear the image of being loved as we worship you, the stamp of the Son, the character and the nature of Christ gets stamped on us. It begins to slowly but surely, line upon line, precept upon precept, moment by moment, glory to glory, being transformed into the same image of the Son, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. We thank you that you've called us for such a time as this. We could have been born somewhere else in some other time frame, but you've called us here. You've called us to overcome. You've called us to be in love with you in spite of, Lord, a, a world that, Lord Jesus, is completely different from the world we originally, Lord, grew up in. But you're alive, and you want to live in us. You want the Spirit of God to be this temple, this vessel of the Holy Spirit, the temple of God, the place that you call home on earth is in our hearts. And then in a collective grouping and graced by gathering together a form family for the dwelling place of God on the earth. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We thank you now, Lord, as we face this week and we want to give this week afresh to you and ask you to help us Holy Spirit to make it a week of dedication as has been prayed, talked about that we'll allow your spirit to take and cast an eye over our calendars over our phone usage over areas of our life that God you will help us to make some adjustments in order to make room in order for the highest call we have to worship you. That then will, Lord, become a lifestyle where we live it out in the great commandment of God to love our neighbor, to love others. Help us with this, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You glad you came?
We're glad you came. How about if we ask the worship team to lead us in one more? Is that all right with you? Oh, yeah, come, come on. Come on. All right, boys and girls. How much do it. About it. Lead us out.
You are good and I'll shout because you are good. You are good, good to me. Turn to the person next to you and say, God is good.